think we were going to have a little a little of house lights on the audience. Can we have a little lights on them, please, so we can see their lovely faces? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's a bit warmer. You might actually find that the lights being on warms you up a little bit. You just you don't know. But if the lights don't warm you, we're here to warm you. At least we hope so. Um, it's really a great. It's a great delight to be here today. Um, my name's uh, Jackie Kay. I'm the Scottish Macker. And Macker's uh, the national poet um, of Scotland, in case any of you don't know what Macker is. Because it's one of those words, Macker, what do you Macker that? <laughs> Today's event is part of the International Literature Showcase, a partnership between the National Centre for Writing and the British Council with the support of the Arts Council England and Creative Scotland. The showcase aims to promote writers of outstanding talent and began with Elif Safax selection of women writers at London Book Fair in March, followed by Val McDermott's choice of LGBTQ and I writers in Edinburgh in August. The project is a call to worldwide literature festivals, publishers and academics to look again at writing from contemporary Britain and broaden the scope of writers considered for festivals, translation and academic study. Welcome to our audiences worldwide who are joining us today via the live stream. Shall we give them all a wave? Everybody give a wee wave. That, that's to the 10 people out there that are ready. <laughs> we love each and every one of you. <laughs> the funny thing is that we have no idea, but in our modern world, we have a very, very strong sense of being watched which is different really from how it used to be and how things used to be. But these are the people to watch here. This is my selection of 10 BAME writers, a, a term that came in not that, that long ago, um, but a term that is, is welcome in the sense that we need to see and hear more from writers from a really wide and diverse um, background. My selection is, and I'm announcing it now, isn't this exciting? Jay Barnard, Mary Jean Chan, Eric Ngali Charles, Imtiaz Darker, Michael Donker, Diana Evans, Nadine Aisha Jassat, who's here. Where are you, Nadine? There she is. Safar Kunil, Jennifer Nasimbuga Makumbi, Olumidi Pupula. Let's give them all a big round of applause. We're going to begin today's um, event with everybody who's going to introduce themselves to you and do a short, a short reading of, of five minutes or so. But first, if you could just introduce yourselves and then we'll do the little reading, beginning with Eric. My, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for having me here. It's, been a pri it's a privilege to meet you, Jackie. My name is Eric Ngale Charles. Eric is a name my mother calls me when I've done something wrong. <laughs> Ngale means somebody who creates thunder. And Charles, my mom has never called me that name, so maybe I'm just a Mormon tracking my family tree. Thank you very much. So, um, my name is Jennifer Nansu Bugamakombi. I live in Manchester, but I am Ugandan, and I write uh, prose. Um, my fiction is mainly about Ugandans because I believe the world doesn't know much about us apart from Idi Amin and uh, HIV AIDS and recently homophobia. And I wish uh, to tell people how beautiful we are and ridiculously ugly we can get and how incredibly clever and innovative but absolutely dumb we are. So I, I write about the history of Uganda before Europe came, because you know people imagine that Africa didn't have history before Europe. So I write about Buganda Kingdom before it became Uganda, because the, the English did not hear the, the B. So it became Uganda, but it's actually supposed to be Buganda. And of course I write about Ugandans in Britain, and we are up to no good uh, here. And I, oh, my third book, which is coming out next year, is dealing with traditional Ugandan feminism. Again, people imagine that there was no feminism in Africa before feminism traveled from here. But we did, and it was called Moenkanu Nkanu. So my third book will be introducing the world to traditional 
African feminisms. I'm, I'm Zafar Konyal. Uh, I'm a poet. I was born in this country in Birmingham and I live in Hebden Bridge now. And I, I have a poetry book published by Favour called Us, which came out last year. And this year I also have this pamphlet about cricket. Uh, well it's called Six and its subtitle is Cricket Poems. Um, um, but I should say uh, it's, it's not just about cricket, it's about time as well, I think. Um, just trying to sell it to everyone, really. Um, <laughs> But uh, but y yes, and I yeah, and I I write poems, uh, and I think we might have a chance to hear briefly from each of our work later on. So I won't say more more than that now. Yeah, so if I could ask you ask you to just read for for five minutes or so, so as you get a real sense of the the flavour of each of these different different writers. I mean, I should say that when I was growing up, I didn't get any chance really to come across any writers from any other back backgrounds. Um, the only writer that I came across, uh, African writer I came across at school was Wale Sainka with, um, with the poem Telephone Conversation. And so I was 1920 before I came across different writers from the Caribbean, from, from African American writers from India. I remember going to Stirling University and doing a course on the Indian novel and discovering writers like Mokraj Anand and Anita Desai and feeling like my whole world started to open up and that through reading I could travel too and through reading I could also find and discover characters that had had similar experiences to me who'd felt on the outside of things, who'd felt like they didn't completely and utterly um, belong and it seems to me that reading and being able to read a wide variety of literature from all around the world is, 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 is essential to our sense of who we are as people um, in, in this world. And so the, the part of my excitement about collating this list of, of wonderful writers is to give readers a chance to perhaps come across writers that they hadn't yet encountered and to hear their voices and to get a real sense of them. So here we go, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be reading from from my autobiography, I Eringale Charles, which came out on the 1st of June, published by Parthian Books. Um, but I just need to give you my state of mind, how I got to that stage where I wrote this book. I left Cameroon when I was 17 on my way to Belgium, but I've never been to Belgium. I ended up with a one-way student visa to Russia. I stayed in Russia for two years, two months, and I, after seven attempts of leaving Russia, which failed, I ended up in Wales as a 62-year-old Zimbabwean. And you can find that now. Are those not shadows lurking in the place I once called home? Underneath this kitchen is our family shrine. Behind this kitchen is my father's grave. My grandmother will be joining him soon. Are those not my sisters I see? Are those not my brothers I see? Yesterday you loved me. Today your faces mask so much hatred, so much disdain. How long have you been planning this? I am hell bound. Of that, I am certain. I do not care for the voices of my ancestors to rescue me. Are you not my sister? Did we not fish in the streams of Moray? Did we not cook together? You know, I was not of this earth. As I stood there, a can of petrol in one hand, a box of matches in the other hand, gazing at my father's house with deadly intent, madness in my heart, dead in my soul. You know, the night was silent, as if it were holding its breath. Even the moon, the moon could not bear to watch as it hid behind angry clouds, the likes of which seldom trouble African skies. But as I stepped forward to set the wheels in motion that will carry me into damnation, I heard my mother's voice piercing through the cloud. My mother cried in the voices of my ancestors and those before her. My mother cried, Agbe wolo atimbangundu, Agbe wolo e atimbangundu e, we yo ma we ya we anje e, we ya uma mo kaka me ma. And I turned around, followed my mother's voice, but there was no new dawn seeping through the horizon. You see, my mother's voice may have halted my actions on that day, but I, Motimbeli, the one who comes and goes. I, Okule Kule, the wise one. I, Yomandene, the guardian of the mountain where my grandmother lived after her death, a mountain of broken heart. I, 
every ngale, I will have my revenge in this life and not wait for the next. So I thought. Thank you very much. Brilliantly, brilliantly performed and brought to life for us. It's fantastic. We could hear all of those voices and see everything. It was wonderful. Thank you. Jennifer. I'm reading. Okay. I'm reading from uh, my collection of short stories called Manchester Happened. And um, I'm reading from a story that is set in the 1950s. Um, this is a Ugandan arriving from which was then Uganda, the colony, um, arriving at the center of the empire. And this is how he felt. It was approaching 10 o'clock when Abu and Rua arrived in Manchester. The city center was at once beautiful and scary. Here was his wish to travel beyond the seas coming true without him even fighting in a war, but he was petrified just to walk through Manchester. The infrastructure alone of brick and stone was forbidding. The skyline dotted by conical, sharp church steeples and tall chimneys made him feel trapped. There was a church at every turn, arches and arches above doors and windows and on walls and on every building. In Mombasa, in Zanzibar, the Arab culture along the East African coast had conjured a Muslim heaven of domes and large empty rooms with carpets and moisines. Manchester brought to mind a Christian heaven of arches and arches and spires and steeples and pews and church bells. But why would the British sculpt snarling devils on their walls when they lived in such dark, misty environs? Statues, some larger than humans, some tiny, some on horses, some gleaming black, frowned and grimaced. Everywhere he was surrounded by such tall buildings, he was dizzy from turning and looking up. Neither gods nor spirits would ever make him go up there. His neck started to ache. At ground level, shops had, had bright striped canopies as if to cheer up the atmosphere. They sold glittering jewelry and sparkly watches and shimmering things for which Abu did not know. White women dressed in long blanket coats and wide-brimmed hats walked with their arms linked with their men's arms. Abu still hung on to Rua. Rua kept yanking him off the road, which was dangerous especially those motorcycles with side cars whizzing past, not to mention cars and buses everywhere. Then, once in a while, the horses and carts, especially that freaky horseshoe noise coming from behind you. But the pavements were not safe either. You could sleep on, her, on in horse dung or walk into the wa water and food troughs that had been put out for the horses. Once they got away from the overpowering spectacle of the city center, Abu excelled. Now, bomb sites, former churches and houses, started to appear. Some were being cleared, some were being rebuilt, some untouched. Did you see how the men hold the women's hand? Yeah, because it's cold, that's how they keep warm. He laughed. But this code really rules them too much. Mm -hmm. But if Manchester, a younger city, looks like this, what is London like? Rua clicked his tongue in like you even ask. This Manchester is rugs compared. London is where King George lives. At night, London blinks like a woman, even on the walls. Nya, nya, he made signs of flashing lights. Abu pondered this, he realized that he could not picture a city that blinks like a woman and changed the subject. But why does everyone build similar houses? Does the king not allow them different fashions? You could get lost here. They don't build their houses. The king does it for them. What? He spoils them like that? 
or stop asking stupid questions. They pay him. And look, all the houses have numbers. You can't get lost. Numbers? Like they are too stupid to find their own houses? Rua shook his hand off. Now, walk by yourself. You're annoying me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I might start with a p poem uh, that's a title poem called Us, um, which uh, looks at this small word, us, that carries a kind of a world of difference. And my, my, my mum is uh, white English, and my, my father's Pakistani Kashmiri. And um, so this looks at the word us. If you ask me, us takes in undulations, each wave in the sea, all insides compressed, as if from one coast you could reach out to the next, and maybe it's a Midlands thing, but when I was young, us equally meant me, says the one. Oi, you, tell us where you're from, and the way football fans share one fate. I, being one, am Liverpool, no less, cresting the Mexican wave of we and us, a shore-like state, two places at once, God knows what's in it, and at opposite ends, my heart sunk at separations of us. When it comes to us, colour me unsure, something in me or it has failed the course. I'd love to think I could stretch to it, us, but the waves therein are too wide for words. I hope you get here where I'm coming from. I hope you're with me on this, between love and loss, where I'd give myself away, stranded as if the universe is a matter of one stress, us. I hope from here on I can say it, and though far-fetched, it won't be too far wrong. Um, shall I do another poem? Yeah. Um, uh, I might read a cricket poem then. Uh, uh, this is, I sometimes write about borders and boundaries and being in the middle of things. And this is about a lost cricket ball. Fielder, if I had to put my finger on where this started, I'd trace a circle round the one moment I came to, or the one that placed me, a fielder, just past the field, over the rope, having chased a lost cause, leathered for six, when, bumbling about, obscured in the bushes, I completely stopped looking for the ball, perhaps irresponsibly, slowed by bracken, caught by light, that slipped the dark cordon of rhododendron hands, a world hidden from the batsmen, the umpires, and my team. Like the thing itself, that small seamed planet shined on one half, having reached its stop out of the sphere of sight. And when I reflect here from this undiscovered city, well north of those boyish ambitions, for the county, maybe later the country, I know something of that minute, hold something of me there, beyond the boundary, in that edgeland of central England, a shady fingernail of forest, the pitch it points at, or past, a stopped clock, still in the middle the keeper's gloves clap at the evening, still a train clicks on far off tracks, and the stars are still to surface, the whole field, meanwhile, waiting for me, some astronaut or lost explorer, to emerge with a wave that brings the ball, like time itself, to hand, a world restored, but what I'd come to find in that late hour was out of mind, and the thing is, I didn't care, and this is what's throwing me now. Um, shall, shall I read one, one tiny more po poem just called Prayer, and I'll just end with this one, because this, this one um, brings two worlds together. Prayer, first heard words delivered to this right ear. Allahu Akbar, God is great, by my father in the Queen Elizabeth maternity ward. God's breath in man returning to his birth, says Herbert, is prayer. If I continued his lines from there, from birth, a break Herbert chimes with heaven and earth, I'd keep in thought my mum on a Hereford hospital bed and say what prayer didn't end. I'd say I made an animal noise, hurled languages hurt, at midday when word had come. Cancer, now so spread, by midnight her rings were off. I stayed on, at her bed. 
earlier time and rhythm flatlining I whispered thank you I love you thank you mouth at her ear she stared on ahead I won't know if she heard thank you Thank you for those, those readings, terribly moving, that, that last poem. Um, and th that sense of, of, of being in two places at once and of being um, beyond the, the borders and the boundaries um, that you, in a sense that you all made reference to in, in each of those readings, a, a way of seeing a place um, like Manchester through new eyes afresh. Um, a, a way of looking for something that you don't realise that you're looking for in the in the last poem, and a way of of, of arriving uh, through a kind of a, a strange journey that feels like it's a journey um, towards the self as, as much as as much as anything else. And I'm really interested in that in that subject um, as a writer that we that we we try and create these simultaneous places, if you like, that we're that we're we're from. We try and create the sense of two places or more at once, um, but we're also on some kind of journey or or, or, or odyssey um, often. And did, did you feel like that, Eric, when you started writing? I I I did I did, and it took me up until 2013 to find my real voice. Um, I remember all those years ago. I was invited to attend a conference on literature and trauma in Planditno, North Wales. And I had just arrived from Russia. I didn't know what trauma was. And I listened to Kate Aidy, and she spoke about her times in Iran and wars. But I met a wonderful writer called Fazana. Fazana was a victim of human trafficking, and they left Afghanistan to Istanbul. But in Uzbekistan, Fazana's mother died. And uh, Fazana's father died. So in order to pay the human traffickers, Fazana's mother kind of offered herself to them. But in the course of the journey, Fazana's mother became blind. So as she st told us this story, I started thinking to myself, maybe Fazana's mother's blindness was she wanted to become blind because she didn't want to see these human traffickers taking their te turns ejaculating all over her. Then I remember the very first story my mother told me as I was growing up. Behind her kitchen, there's one of the biggest trees in sub-Saharan Saharan Africa. And this tree is the Iroko tree. And on the side of the Iroko tree, there's a very small insect. We call it molikilikili. In English, I think it's, it's a stick insect. No matter what time of day, that stick insect is on the side of this tree, pushing it. But nobody notices until one day the millipede stops and inquires as to what the stick insect is doing to this tree. So the stick insect says, for 4,000 years, this tree has been blocking my sunshine. My foods <laughs> don't grow anymore, so I'm going to push this tree until it falls to the ground. So the millipede shakes its head and goes away. Three months later, on its way back, the stick insect is still pushing this tree. So the millipede does something that we tend to do. It invokes the gods. So the millipede invokes the god to render it deaf and blind because it did not want to see what the stick insect was doing to this tree. So I thought to myself, so can blindness be desired? If so, what have those eyes seen to desire to see no more? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is where I come in. Uh -huh. Jennifer, what, what do you think of that sense of two places at once? Because I noticed when I was reading through the stories in Manchester happened. It's a great, great collection. You, you have stories that are sort of Ugandan centered, if you like, and stories that are Manchester centered. And there's a sense of returning. And often when you're in Manchester, you're kind of longing to to be in Uganda. And yeah. then when you're in Uganda, you're longing to be in oh, Manchester. Absolutely. And and um, once you have a sense of two places, you can often feel as if your life is, is spent with this with this sense of 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 always being in the shadow of the other place. Yeah, um, I'm 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 glad you made that connection between being a writer and being in this place that you're writing um, when you're writing or, or th this world that you're creating as an author and then slipping back into the real world as connected to 
me being in Manchester um, and then thinking about home and then uh, being ho uh, at home and then thinking ab about Manchester. It's, um, I've never connected the two, but pa perhaps that's why I'm so comfortable being an author or that's why I'm so comfortable being in Manchester because I can sleep between those two spaces. Now, for a long time, um, uh, Manchester was away and Uganda was home. But recently, I went home and uh, I was talking to my mother. And I said, when I go back home, and she, you know, it really hit her. And, and then I realized what I had done. Suddenly, I had called Manchester home. And it was a kind of desertion to my mother. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, when I go back to Manchester. But that's the nature of sleeping in and out of these worlds, that uh, what used to be home becomes away. What used to be away becomes home. And departures become returns. And often then you start to live in a world of just your own, you know, because you're moving between these worlds. And it's the same as an author. Because I can't live in the world I create. I really immersed my, myself in this world. And I'm those characters. And I can see the world entirely around me. And then I come back. And then I go back. It, it's, it's quite interesting. But it's a way of escaping. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking um, recently, because my, my mom and my dad recently went into a care, care home. And I was thinking that for an old person, um, where is home? You know, home isn't your home anymore because it becomes too dangerous to live in. And home isn't hospital because hospitals are not home. And home is not even a, a, a care home because, because it's not really your actual home. So home then becomes the thing that you carry around inside you in the form of the songs that you've loved, the holidays that you've been on, yes. the memories that yes. you've had, yes. the, the, the few things that you've really loved, the people that you've loved in your lives and the, and the clothes that you can remember wearing and the meals that you can remember uh, eating. And, and home becomes a portable, movable thing. And um, and uh, and not a static thing, not 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 a physical thing, um, but but more a, me a metaphysical thing, a thing yeah. made of all sorts sorts. And I, I was thinking about that that, that for um, for writers from the di diaspora, mm -hmm. that's exactly the same. That home is that too. That home is something portable that you have to find a way to carry around you, and that the only way that you have of connecting your your past to your present is through your your living, breathing, remembering yes. self in a, in a sense. Um, would you, would you say that feels like that, Zaf? <coughs> sorry. Yeah, 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 that's very moving. The, the idea of carrying around the home and um, actually, my my father used to talk about back home. You know, when I was young, and that used to always confuse me. Like um, I used to hear him say back home and and um, I think he meant, you know, where we lived, but he didn't at all. But I, I, th I think that's quite a common feeling amongst a lots of people, actually, this, and lots of writers, this idea of being split or torn between two places, and even this feeling of being in two times at once, you know. And w when I go back to, w when I go to where my father lived, <coughs> sorry, to, to, to visit his, his mother, it was a very remote village, and it did feel like going back in time, actually, because there, there was no electricity, no running water. Um, and in a deeper way, um, it's more of an oral culture. And so it, it, was, it was almost like a, an insight into a different, a different way of thinking as well, wi which, and a different way of perceiving time. Uh, and, and that stays with you. But, but I think a lot, a lot of writers have this feeling of, you know, trying to marry different worlds together. And when I was young, um, I really was confused about who I was and what I was and how my parents quite fitted together. Um, but that's not a bad thing, I think, for a writer. Um, I, think, I think those questions that you have at an age where you can't quite articulate the answer, um, they stay with you all your life, I think, because you're, you're more those questions that you can't articulate, never mind the answer, when you're very young, they, they haunt you, I think, all your life. Um, but I think there's, there's something about the soul that, that maybe is in two places at once. And so that's where m maybe the position of a migrant or a, a, a child of migrants or someone who's been forced to question the idea of home, it, it, it 
maybe the universal element, element of that is something to do with the soul, which, which doesn't feel like it belongs anywhere necessarily or, or that doesn't know where it comes from. And perhaps that's why. Because I often find that when you read these poems and stories that people relate to them, don't they, you know, about yeah. displacement. And we all feel torn, yeah. you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, not just they have this word, and it's it's Pirayeth, um that longing for a place in Cameroon, in the, in my in my language in Bakuri, have is is a roli roli, so a roli roli is that longing for a place or a, lo a longing for some a loved one that has gone that might never return. Um, until 2013, I kept departing, even though I had arrived in Cardiff. So I found myself that even if I'm doing poetry or a play, I long back to to go into the the ruins of my dream and my once broken landscape. But more importantly, I wanted to go and sit by the fire in my mother's kitchen because that is where home is for me. Mm -hmm. That kind of I'm permanently back and forth between this. But when I'm in Cameroon, I have that hiraya, that longing for Wales. And when I'm in Wales, I have that longing for Cameroon. Because nostalgia as a word came about because the people longed for the longed for the home towns, the people in the mountains longed for the the little towns below in Switzerland, and that's how the, the whole concept of nostalgia came came about. And it's interesting that, that this distilled time or the sense of distilled time that we get um, from nostalgia and from that kind of longing. But I'm interested in all all three of you came to writing relatively late in a sense, and do you feel that coming to writing at the age that you D you did come to, I mean, can you, can you just tell everybody a little bit about how you came to be a writer and what that journey was like from the journey of, of not necessarily expressing yourself as a writer to the journey of being able to express yourself as a writer? To be honest, the very first poem I wrote, I was about eight years old, and my brother had bought the book called The Swahili Songs of Love and Passion. It was written in Swahili and translated in English. I loved the book so much that I wanted to write a poem for my mom. And she brought her children who were sitting in the, in the kitchen. And the poem went, Dearest mother, you are as beautiful as the snowflakes of Siberia. <laughs> Everybody knows where you are. No one dares. My mom kicked me out of her house. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got lost in Russia, uh, crossing mountains and sea, seeking peace and finding none, and I came to Wales in July 1999, I was homeless, stateless, I was voiceless and all of these things. But I came across a Welsh poem which was discovered in the 8th century. And in one stanza it says, My spirit craves to sit on top of a hill, not that I'll up and go. Noisy the birds, damn the valleys, long the night was rare is praised, and I deserve the reward of age. I read that poem in Clandino, and when I was traveling to Abetawe in Swansea, I kind of had an epiphany, I read that, I was the only one who could tell this story. And yeah, so I, I started writing. And my very first poem is the title of my first anthology, which is Between a Mountain and a Sea. That is when I realized that oh, maybe, just maybe, Wills is my new home. And in the stan there's a stanza that says, on a wet journey from Clandidno, I'm washing away pain and longing. A reborn voice is crying between a mountain and a sea. Where voices echoed across horizons and conversations on common things, please wake me. Wake me from my slumber, and this poem will be over. I wrote this poem in uh, 2001, and that kind of mm. set the tone to where I am today. Yeah, and, and that sense of between the mountains and the sea, did you, did you start writing, Jennifer, from that, that sense of being between places, between ages, between, did you? Was there something that kind of provoked you into thinking, I've got to tell this story, some kind of epiphany like er Eric described, or, or was it more gradual than that? It, it was. Um, I wasn't one of those children who knew there would be authors when they grew up. Um, so um, I was a teacher before I started writing. But I had written, you know when you're in boarding school and you have houses, and then you have competitions for houses, mm -hmm. Uh, normally, the A-levels were supposed to write the play, so it was drama. And when one year our house, the A-levels didn't write the play. So I was 
by then in senior three, so I wrote the play for the competition. But at that time, I didn't consider it as writing. I was just doing a duty. So again, when I got into A-levels, I did, again, so I linked my writing back to writing uh, plays. But you know, with plays, the audience is immediate, and everything is done, and you throw away the script and move on. And so it wasn't until I was a, um, a teacher, was, I used to teach English in Uganda, when the headmaster in my school, he was called James Park. He came from Kent, started a school in Uganda, gave me a job. And then he said to me one day, Jennifer, I cannot believe this. Do you know what they believe in England? I've never been out of East Africa. They think that all Africans are sitting here waiting for aid. But I, I wake up every morning and all you can are going out to work and they're doing their job there, looking after their children. And I try to understand a world where somebody would think Ugandans wake up and sit at the door waiting for aid to come. So I say, Jennifer, write. You really need to write and tell the world the truth. So <laughs> I came to writing with that attitude. Like, you know, Africa needed me to go out there and tell the world that it is not lazy. <laughs> so yeah, I started writing, we are not lazy. <laughs> Was that the title? <laughs> <laughs> um, stop it. Uh, uh, I, I wrote a, a novel, and my friend read it, and uh, I wrote it in a very short time. I think in two months it was finished. My friend read it and said, I love it. And I thought, okay, this might work. But then later I asked her, what did you enjoy most? Which book in literature did you enjoy most? And she said, Animal Farm. I said, ah, oh, okay. And she said, that's the, um, the book about Napoleon, the, 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 the empire of France. I thought, okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm um, not an author, but anyway, so I gave it up. <laughs> but then she came to Manchester and saw a creative writing course, and she said, what you wrote, Jennifer, was wonderful. Do come and do a course here. So I came to Manchester uh, Metropolitan to do my MA, and if I actually, by then I realized I cannot write Africa. I can't even write the tiny space of Africa that I occupy. So I decided to write whatever I wanted to, you know, whatever came out of me. It was until my first novel came out and it, it was rejected left, right, and center that I decided that actually I'm going to be an author mm -hmm. and, and set to writing a second novel, which they rejected. I wrote, I wrote the short stories, and at that time they, they accepted the second book and then they published the... <coughs> <laughs> the collection, which is the third book, and next year they are publishing the first book. <laughs> which I, I it stops you terribly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting that, isn't it? It shows you, I mean, amongst other things, that one of the things that a writer needs to have most, most of all is a kind of self-belief. But it's a strange thing because also a writer needs to have self-doubt. And um, it's like you need to have self-doubt and self-belief in, yeah. in equal measure. It's a kind of a Jekyll and a Hyde profession you go, yes yes no no <laughs> all the time and you're, you're constantly affirming and negating um yourself and i think many people that are in the audience that are writers themselves will will recognize that that there is a a little uh, a little person that sits in your shoulders yes. shoulders saying that you can't and and one on the other side that says yes yes you can um zaf how did you come to it um, uh, I, I i wasn't really very li literary when i was young um although my mum my mum, who was a, my mum was a primary school teacher, and there were some books from wh the days when she was at teaching college. Like she had Iris Murdoch, and she had a copy of T. S. Eliot. And my, but my dad worked in a factory, and wasn't um, the only the two, two books that we, he had. The one was Tony Benn's Arguments for Socialism, which he never read, but he was in a trade union, so he, he bought that. And <laughs> um, obviously, the Quran, which was up, uh, up on we used to keep it on the wardrobe, on top of the wardrobe, wrapped up, and I was very scared of it. And I was always a bit scared of books, actually. I thought they had this big power. Um, for my dad's culture, c books were very kind of important and also very distant. And that's never quite left me, actually. Um, even when I walk around a place like this and I'm meant to be like a writer, I still feel a bit like, 
imposter syndrome and everything. Um, but it, it started, uh, um, literature really happened in a big way when I read Buddha of Suburbia by Hanif Qureshi. I was 19 years old and um, people kept saying to me, oh, there's this book wi where, where it's, half, ha it's half English and half Pakistani or Indian. Um, and I still remember the first line, my name is Karim Amir and I'm an Englishman born and bred almost. And that, that really meant a lot to me, that, that first line. And it kind of set up a lot. And uh, uh, so I studied politics at university, but I, I was that was when I was mostly reading literature and I was just trying to catch up. I never studied A-level literature or anything. I had to resit my GCSEs. Um, and but. I love literature now, and I, 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 I comment on a lot of old poems and Shakespeare, and that poem you I read before had a bit of Herbert in it. Um, and th there's a real anxiety for me to somehow place myself in British literature and be accepted or something. Um, but I also genuinely love classics like Dickens and stuff yeah. like that. I know, because there's this kind of ridiculous thing where people seem to ask you to, to choose. You know, I think when you, have, when you come from a complex identity, people are always asking, what do you value? You know, wh what will you put first? You know, and people are always saying to me, are you, are you black first and then Scottish second and then lesbian third? And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and it becomes quite, becomes quite a r ridiculous, but it also... Um, th th there also is a, a, a need to name um, ourselves for people to be able to find mm -hmm. um, us. So wh where, do you, where do you sit in, in, in that? Because here we are, um, and we're, we're writers all collected together under um, the, the idea of, of black and ethnic minority writers um, to make ourselves more visible and to make people, to make it easier for readers all over to find us. Do you, but do you find any of that? I'm problematic, or do you embrace it? How do you feel about it? Before uh, I hand this is just before I hand it out to the to the audience. I, ask I, question. I, I embrace it. I really don't mind. But I state one fact: I'm from Cameroon. Yeah, so um, that, that is a, that is very important to me. Uh, uh, if you want to put me under this umbrella, so that people can access my work, that's fine by all means. Mm -hmm. But um, I want this module to be repeated across the UK and beyond. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you see, I grew up in Uganda, and by the time I came here, I was formally placed in, um, th not that identity mattered in Uganda, you know, mm -hmm. um, my identity was my, <laughs> my name, you know, but it's until I came to Britain that I became uh, quite visibly aware that I was African, that I was black, and, and um, but also I was aware that there's something undesirable about being African that was there in people's, the way people looked at me, the things people said to me. And I immediately, immediately embraced being African. Like I was in your face, African. I was militant African. I've only recently relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I would, uh, like, I, uh, I'm, I'm a lecturer. And I knew that uh, the first time I walked into a, uh, a class, the student asked me, uh, when is the lecturer coming? <laughs> and I said, this is it. Because I was aware that uh, these children have grown up not with, the African was the kind of person they took knowledge to. They did not receive knowledge from an African. And so I started to become, uh, you know. So I would walk into a class and I would say, my name is Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi, but you can call me Jennifer. Leave Nansubuga and Makumbi alone, and I'm African. And listen carefully to how I speak, because words like but and but and but and whatever but, they're all going to sound the same. My African tongue is not going to take care of the nuanced pronunciation. So um, by then, I became really African. So if you asked me, what are you, I would say I'm African. But actually, I'm only African when I'm here uh, <laughs> in Britain. Uh, as soon as I go home, I'm just Jennifer. So I do, I do embrace the BAME tag because it's British. I suspect it will change perhaps in 10 or 15 years' time. But I always insist I'm Ugandan. Yeah. 
I remember I was in Uganda the last time uh, Jennifer and I met. I was in uh, Uganda, and it, it, it was exciting to me because um, because I didn't grow up in anywhere in in in, in Africa or in any part of Africa. So it was yes. exciting to me that in Uganda somebody said to me, "Uganda welcomes you as her own daughter." <laughs> <laughs> I find that very exciting. Well, like that, yeah. Yeah. It to yeah. myself, you know. Yes. Um, but it's also to do with them. Um, I. I, I one sense of identity is, to, is, is al almost also to do with when you have been welcomed and by whom, and we remember the moments in our life, you know, yep. if we go through really from a child right, right to an older woman or an older man, we remember the moments in our life when we've been welcomed and the moments when we've actually felt not welcome mm. uh, at all. And those, those moments of welcome and not welcome, of being unwelcome, yeah. are defining points uh, yeah. in our life. I mean, I can see people thinking away and thinking of equivalents in their head, and everybody will have their equivalents of, of, of being welcomed and, 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 not, and not being welcomed. So. <coughs> yeah, I really resonate with that. Um, I, lo I love what you said about being welcomed. It actually made me think what I was thinking was that's what, how I felt when I really felt at home in reading was that feeling of being welcomed into another person's world and wherever they were from. And I love the idea of the, the, through, you know, when you're reading a novel and you, you, you're completely there and you, and you feel somehow understood as well. And, and so, so perhaps, uh, you know, that feeling of being at home in books it is something I, I resonate with and it means a lot to me. Um, and, it, and it's a real joy and honour to be on the same platform uh, here. here. And it's, uh, um, it means uh, a lot to me, but I also worry sometimes when we're, we're not seen as writers who also are metaphysical or also think about, you know, religion or, you know, you know just, mm. just identity. It always comes, to, you know, people often will, will kind of think he writes about identity, she writes about her confusion about wh where she's living, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's there. Mm. Well, of course we're going to write about that because we grew up worried about it. Uh, and we, or later on, we had experiences that made us want to be a writer about. It. So we will write about that, and I won't stop writing about that. But but I'm also writing about other things, uh, and and, oh, and we all are. And you know, and um, and that's just down to the sophistication of a reader. And that's what literature teaches us: is to be nuanced with how you see people. And that's why I feel home in literature, is because it is a home of nuance. You know. Absolutely, a home of nuances is, is great because we don't really want definitions to become limiting or reductive, um, and we don't want to feel as if we're somehow less than, um, less than what we can be, less than our ambitions, and, and we don't want to feel as if what we've got to say is somehow reduced to a single sentence yep. repeated, you know, over and over again. But um, at this point, I'd like to just to open it out to the audience and see if people have any questions, anything that they'd like to ask any of our. Wonderful, yes. Thank you, I was saying thank you. Um, I was particularly um, pleased and charmed to hear uh, from Eric, clearly your passion and interest in languages, or whether it's Welsh or, your, or your m one of your mother tongues, maybe. Um, I have a question to all of you about, thank you, um, audiences and language um, and how you square that circle between who you're writing for and the languages that you're using to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, Go on. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. Um, I'm from Cameroon. And we have 320 languages in Cameroon, mm -hmm. but we've been told our wings have been clipped, our tongues have been cut, and we've been told that we can only speak English and French. And so we, 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 we kind of rebelled against this diktat, and we speak pidgin. But the, most, the language that I'm most comfortable in is Bakwiri, which is from my Bantu descendants. But I speak Russian fluently. So when I'm in front of an audience, I introduce them to Bakwiri first because I go back to my mother's kitchen and I bring other languages into it. But I make sure that I come back to either English or French just to put people at ease. But the one language that I'm most comfortable in is the language of my ancestors and that is Bakwiri. Uh, now in my case, uh, because I studied literature 
um, uh, quite from a young age. I was aware of what uh, Nguji said about English, um, Africans writing in English, um, and what Achebe wrote about writing in English and decolonizing African literature if we're going to write in the colonizers' languages. Um, but um, here's one thing, uh, that um, um, in Uganda, like uh, in Cameroon, we have 54 languages, okay? And um, only English brings us together. And I would like not only to communicate to all those 54 other e ethnicities, but I would like um, Africans right from Cape Town all the way to Cairo to understand what I'm doing, first and foremost, before we travel to Europe and America and Russia and everywhere. And so when, because I used to teach English, when I started writing, I, I would write in proper, grammatically correct English when I started writing, even though Ugandans don't speak mm. that grammatically correct English, even though my characters would be speaking Luganda, you know? And so when I arrived in, in uh, to do my creative um, course, students would say, yeah, 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 that Ugandan speaks tutored English. And I didn't understand in the beginning. But I don't know when or how it happened. Then I switched. And my characters would speak English. The, either the way Ugandans speak English, because we don't speak it the way the British do, or I would write it the way I would translate it straight from Luganda. And whenever English let me down, I just went native. <laughs> you know, really, because, you know, I've met French and Russian in English books, but I still understand, because there's a way authors gloss what they're saying within the context without having a glossary. So um, once I worked out that, I, started, I created my own language, uh, and I decided that whenever English is inadequate, I would use my first language. Did you have something to say about um, screen? Um, well, about, about, about language, or I suppose I sometimes you use uh, little snippets and pe pepper my poems with some of my father's speech, which is you know foreign and. Um, but but he, he, his language actually is not necessarily one that's written down anywhere. And it, I've got a poem called "He'll Speak," which which is about how I didn't know the name for his language, uh, and um, and it's actually seen as a low language. Uh, and once I was in a taxi driver uh, in a taxi, in a, a taxi was from the same part of the world, and he he he, um, he I asked him about the name of his language, and he said uh, it doesn't have a name. Uh, it's just our language. And I never forgot that. And he also said, by the way, you shouldn't learn our language. Uh, you should learn Urdu, because that's the language of books. That's the beautiful language. And, um, and yeah, I'm fascinated by the idea of different registers of language and speech, and how little words make us feel at home or not at home. And it's good to have poems in with, with, with something that throws you, I think. It's, you know. And just, just to add to that, you know, if we were not meant to speak. Why give us a voice? Mm. You know, mm. those are mm. fundamental. Uh, and if we're meant to speak, in which, in which language must we speak? That kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a conundrum. It's a really good, good question, because you can have uh, lo lots and lots of, and it's a question that people ask all over um, because there's so-called standard English, and then there's all different, it's all Scottish writers have had to come to terms with, if you're a Gaelic writer, do you write in Gaelic? Um, and how many people then will be able to read you if you just write in Gaelic, and, and so on. I mean, I think these are, these are questions that you have to ask almost wherever you're from as a writer, and also to, uh, as Zaf was, was talking about there, as you're, you're all talking about of, of finding ways to bring different elements together, like different pieces of language together, different roots of language together, and different parts of the self together. Do, do we have another question out there? Yes. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank you for this very inspiring hour. Um, it's not a question, but to say that in these days when we have to listen to so much political claptrap, which reduces thought 
and concepts to absurdity, to hear about language which opens up the world and culture and thought is just a wonderful experience. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much for that. That was beautifully put. Really beautifully put. Shall we have one last question or two last questions? Maybe we'll take two questions at once, that one there, and see if there's another um, one. Not particularly related to writing, but I read this morning that um, the BBC has appointed June Sarpong as a director of creative diversity. Yeah? I wonder if you think this is an exceptionally hopeful appointment or one a bit like the, uh, the fast series of uh, W1A uh, mm -hmm. that is just uh, <laughs> lip service. <laughs> we'll, we'll take that question and, and one other whilst we're going around because we're nearly at the end of our hour. So I thought I'd take a double question to finish. Anybody else got something they'd like to ask? I remember being in Ireland once and the teacher saying you can ask it to the children you can ask the poet anything you like. And this 10-year-old girl put her hand up and she said, what do poems mean? Do they mean anger? Do they mean hate? Do they mean pity? Do they mean revenge? Do they mean sadness? <laughs> <laughs> what do they mean? <laughs> well, all of that, all of that, everything. <laughs> so so that was quite a tricky question to, to yes, end yes. in. And perhaps, um, if you don't mind, I'll just, 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 just broaden, broaden the question a little bit. To, to think about the, when when we um, when we use the word diversity, when you use the word diversity in, in any sense at all, how do you feel about the word? Does the word relate to yourself, or does it feel a distancing word? Does it feel anything to do with you? And does the appointment of June Sanipong feel anything to do with you, Jennifer? Um, and diversity is one of those words, you know, uh, that say something without doing anything for me. And so um, when, when they say diversity, I imagine that all of us would be in the, put in the same pot and will be handled equally and will be given equal opportunities. But that rarely happens, really. And I don't know how the uh, the fact that they've um, chosen uh, June would therefore mean that she would be a good person to uh, to to uh, achieve diversity. Because I I've only seen her on um, a few programs, mm. you know. So I don't know what her politics are. I don't know um, whether they've just put her there as a color. You know, I, I really would not know what to expect. I'll just wait and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have anything, sir? Yeah. Oh, I, I think it's a move in the right direction, yeah. and uh, I'm sure it means well, and, and I hope she, uh, wish her well, and I hope. Uh, but yeah, I suppose the, the words are never good, are they? Words are always like blunt tools, aren't they? And diversity is a very blunt tool. tool. <laughs> it's like when people say, oh, yes, this, you know, sometimes people will tweet and say, yes, we've got so-and-so, uh, so-and-so, and they put my name in, oh, we've got a lovely diverse program. And I think, oh, I'm the diversity. <laughs> you know, I am diversity today. And, uh, <laughs> I'm the diversity. <laughs> I, I, I feel interiorly, in, in an interior way, I feel very diverse and multiple. And <laughs> so <laughs> I don't mind it, but it's, yeah, but w words are never, they, they they kind of aim at aim at something that they don't quite hit, um, but Which but it's yeah. a good it's a good aim. Yeah, because what what you're su what you're saying really, and I guess what the what we we've all been saying in some way or another is that we're very multiple, <laughs> and that and that um, that we shouldn't really have to choose. Um, and and, it, and it's really been wonderful. Um, did you have something else? No, no. I, I'm I was just going to say I'm, I'm a build, I'm a bridge builder. I like building bridges. I, it matters. It matters not who crosses over. Yeah. I like to build bridges, and I think appointing her um, is a step in the right direction. And long may it continues across other institutions and stuff. I really think that's a wonderful uh, closing image to have, that, um, that we are bridge builders. It matters not who crosses over.
I'd like to thank everybody very, very much for coming. Thank you all for coming and for being such a thoughtful and listening and appreciative um, audience. It's been great um, being here. Our hour has gone running in. Um, and thank you hugely to Zafir Kunia. <laughs> Jennifer McCombie. Thank you. And Eric Nigali Charles. Ingali Charles. Ingali Charles. Ingali Charles. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.